join internationally acclaimed overland expert Paul Marsh and award-winning journalist Gregory Simpson as they delve into all things responsible overlanding. From choosing the right vehicle, getting yourself prepared, getting your vehicle prepared, safety tips and much, much more. Only on responsible overlanding. You take two or three or four vehicles in groups and that the dynamics can be difficult. So that's why on short trips it kind of works. But I do say there's a, there's a lot of preparation around that. And it's, it's a whole thing I like to spend time with, with groups or uh, people going to travel together in vehicles. Because, you know, you've got to actually discuss what are the expectations? What are our roles and our responsibilities? How are we actually going to interact if there's a problem? You know, if there's, if there's a situation, how are, we going to, how are we going to manage this as a group? What if we have this situation? When you cover those bases, then you've got parameters in place, you've got a structure in place, which you need. Because if you don't, when something does happen, that's when the tension comes up, that's when the arguments start, yeah. that's when the pressure builds up. So you've never talked about it. You've never talked about it, yeah. <laughs> so have those difficult conversations beforehand, you know, so you actually can be in a much better space when something happens that you can look at how you're going to actually manage the situation. How are we going to, what's the outcome we want? You know, and then it takes away a lot of the stress. And it just manages it better. It reminds you of the Canyon Stock Group trip you did with Andrew and, uh, and other gentlemen. So it was, it was a, that was an amazing trip. You know, we had, I had two very good friends of mine, Justin and Laura, who actually are medical. Uh, Laura's a GP and Justin's a male nurse. And they work in the remote outbacks of Australia. So they were fantastic to have on, on board because they really understood the culture, the Aboriginal culture. And they are really, they've traveled Australia extensively. And then uh, of course, you know, the canning is one of the great big routes to do. It's, it's one of the routes I dreamt of doing for years. And in the opportunity when Andrew asked me and we discussed doing it, it was just like, wow, this could be amazing. So it was a very good dynamic. We did talk about, you know, how we work. And they're also very easygoing people. So it's, it's interesting because, you know, dynamics, we've, we've, we've got into a very good routine. And it's not easy when you're filming. It's, it's actually, you know, it's, it takes a lot of time and effort and, and you, you need whoever's going to be with you to be very amenable to that. But we said that, we discussed that ahead of time. We discussed, we put in place what the expectations were, how we were going to manage it and what was important to allow Andrew to capture what he needed to because at the end of the day this trip was happening around a number of support structures in place and it was a team effort to sort of make the trip happen and really enjoy it but the team has to work together and has to acknowledge what are the parameters we're working in and what's the what's the main goal what's the main focus we all took something out of it canning is an incredible you know it's a very interesting part of the world to, to go and experience that very remote very desolate far from anywhere, relying on waterhole to waterhole and crossing all these, you know, over a thousand dunes, I think. So it's pretty incredible. I really enjoyed that. It was and, and riding shotgun was something that when you used to sort of leading expeditions? Oh, I don't mind. You know, we shared the driving and so we're both very good at that and we both drive well and we both respect each other's driving, we both care for the vehicle in the same way. And so it's, no, it wasn't about that. You know, it was, it was actually about we, we, it wasn't a case of one had to dominate the lead. This was about, we're going to make this happen together. And that was important. That ties in with, with, with everybody knowing what's, what their role is. Do you, is it a democracy out there or do you, how, does it, how do you delegate responsibility? You know, on small groups like that, it's, you know, you're looking at people's strengths and you're looking at what needs to happen. But let's talk about bigger groups because bigger groups have more of a challenge. You know, when you've got very big groups that you work with. personalities. And that's the challenge. So, you know, and I've seen it on many expeditions that I've led and taken. You, you do get people who've got big personalities. Sometimes, you know, it's ego-driven. Sometimes it's fear. And you've got to understand where it comes from because, you know, if you're an expedition leader, you've got to understand the strengths and weaknesses of your group. You've also understand, you know, putting roles and responsibilities in place and, and holding people accountable to those roles and responsibilities. Because if someone, you know, falls back and they don't pull their weight, they become a weak link. Um, and so in any team, you know, if you talk about 
when we did driven to extremes in Siberia, we had minus 60 degrees. Okay, that's extreme. You you know to operate a vehicle at minus 60 degrees. It's near fatal. Yeah, well you know you get to we got to a point where we couldn't get help anymore. We were then self reliant on our own abilities and everything else to to fly a chopper out was just too far. We, we just couldn't. That was the point, and that's quite a critical point. Is going, we can't get help from here forwards. We're going to now rely on ourselves. And when you're at minus 60, if someone does something stupid and puts themselves at risk, okay. as what could happen on any trip when someone does something stupid, they go off and they race over a dune or they don't think and they get their vehicle really bogged or it puts the whole group at risk. And I think that's, you know, on some trips I've had to pull people aside and, and sit down and go, you know what, this is the whole group and you've just compromised the group. Now we're all having to pick up and sort out what you didn't think because you were careless. And I think, you know, if people understand, and that's where I think it's important to understand knowledge. Sometimes it's done out of ignorance and people just didn't know because they didn't have that experience. And other times it's careless. You know, and it is about managing that. And that's where good, good expedition leaders are worth their salt because they understand what it takes to, to actually put a group together and look at the strengths of the group and manage the weaknesses and the problems that go along. It's like anything, you're going to get your ups and downs, you're going to have your problems, not always generated out of you know, someone who's careless. It's a problem that's just emerged and you've got to deal with it. But good expedition leaders then can draw on the strength of the group to mend that back to carry the group forward. And I think it's, you know, that, that's a big, big responsibility. I've done a lot of work with groups and and uh, big expeditions to actually prepare them and it's, it's important to get it right. I, I have a mantra that I say to people, take more knowledge and less kit. And I really mean that. And travel light. And travel light. Now that's quite hard to do because often you're going into stores where people are there to sell the gear and that's their experience. And they don't have the overlanding experience that maybe you gain, that you're going to do in. So it's in their mind you walk in and you're open to knowledge and you're asking for knowledge and experience and they're going to sell you a kit that you probably don't need or maybe it's not the quality that you need. So it is important that you really understand what you need and I, I work very closely with people and I, and I sit down with them and I go okay I need to understand your thoughts on what you think you need to take because it's always a good it's easy to say well you should take this and you should take that. That's my experience. And people have different needs depending on what they want to do. So it's important for us to understand what are your needs, how you're going to travel, where you're going to travel, and what do we need to put together. There's no one perfect solution for every scenario. You know, we went from minus 60 degrees to plus 60 degrees to the jungle in three separate expeditions in one year. And so the equipment we needed was varied between, you know, <clears throat> preparing a vehicle for the jungle and minus 60 different. So there is no one solution but what you do try and do is understand where people go and how do they adapt and what do they absolutely need. So what's essential, what's pivotal to the survival of your trip? What are you going to add in? You know whether it's warm gear, whether it's hiking gear, what needs to be added in and then how are you going to manage that? And it's important then I think to address what you need and don't need because all too often you know get carried away and it's more kit and more kit and believe me I've seen people arrive at an empty vehicle and go well bring all your kit you're going to put in and you know, I had three guys that were driving through Africa I was still in England and they amount they, they brought boot loads of stuff and we just piled it on the floor and I just looked at this and I thought I just don't know how you're going to fit it all in and they must have repacked their car I don't know four five six times and eventually we had they had to acknowledge they were going to leave a lot of stuff behind you know so I, you know, I offer people, I say to them, listen, let's go and shop together if you need that. Or let's go through a very detailed list and let's work out and discuss. Why are you taking that? Can this bit of kit be used for something else? Can you double up with kit? Rather go and do an initial trip. You should all do a test trip in your vehicle. Understand, you know, the vehicle, get familiar with how it's laid out, start to use your equipment, understand where it's going to be, where you're going to put it, and then see where the gaps are. You know, and then go from there. If someone's never travelled on expedition, and if we're building a vehicle for them, first off, you know, a, a new vehicle fully prepped, I don't know, it doesn't matter who builds it, 
needs to have a test strip, a short test strip, so you can snag it, you can test it, you can become familiar with it. That's, that's really important. So I'd be saying to someone, take your truck and go and do a weekend or a week. You're close by, you don't need to go far. Live out of the vehicle, camp in and out, pack it, unpack it, pack it, unpack it. Get familiar where your stuff going to go. Soon you'll figure out where you want to put things. You know, we'll talk about where we might consider putting stuff. And the most important aspect of that is to find a home for everything that you can access. There's no point putting stuff, you know, if you're looking for to change a wheel and the jacks here and the wheel spanner is there and the warning triangles are there. You, you're unpacking half your car and it could be a difficult, dangerous situation where you need to get the wheel changed quickly, you know. So, in my mind, that's important that that's in one place. And there'll be other aspects of your kit that you need to use. So that, that's a proper, important uh, phase in testing your vehicle. As you do longer trips, you know, you'll, you'll hone that down to a finer situation. There will be some kits you find you need, some kits you maybe get a ditch. That's personal. You know, people travel lighter and heavier than others. You know, and that's, that's okay. There's nothing wrong. It's not a right or wrong. It's more about understanding if I'm taking this kit, will I use it? I don't want to carry a kit that I'm going to bring back and I find that it's not used. And you must get a tremendous amount of feedback from clients on what kit works and what yeah. kit doesn't work. Yeah, it's great that. It's really good. You know, it's, you can't test all the kit on the market. And um, I've, had, I've had some really good feedback and ideas from clients. I welcome that. It's brilliant because you know, people do different things on their trips and they come up with different ideas. And you know, There's a host of information out there that you can, you can gather. Now one person came back and said, you know, I've always struggled with my laundry, but I take a, a dry bag and I put my laundry in like a dry bag for kayaking and I put some water in there and I clip it closed and now I can shake it around and I don't need a fixed bucket you know, or something. I can do lots of, oh, great idea. So little things come, you know, from expeditions. And I think what I always say to people is make sure it's always keep it simple because you can get some really complex ideas to build into expedition trucks. And they don't always serve you. You know, when it's when it's complicated, it has a bigger chance of going wrong, and then you need to be able to fix it. So I always say it's it's important that you, if you, if you are going to have something complex, understand how it works. And that's where the training comes back in. You know, people need to understand the electrics on the car. You don't have to be a mechanic, but I'll encourage you to come and work in the workshops and do some work on the car so that you can change a fuel filter, you can adjust your V belts, you. You can understand what needs to be done on a service and then work with checklists. So I'm a great advocate of checklists because then you know you're not going to forget something. So if you're going to have your car serviced, here's a checklist. Here's your daily checks, here's your weekly checks. This is what you need to do when you service the car. So when you've got a mechanic that you've chosen, and that's probably another little, little uh, concept to talk about, but when you've got this, you can give it to him, this list you'd like him to go through, whether it's a Toyota dealership or whether it's a little mechanic that you found that you trust is going to work on your car and you can watch him work and you can make sure that the critical safety elements are checked off so the safety critical elements like wheels are tight some plugs tight oil filters tight waters in the radiator those critical components where you hear stories people driven out of a workshop and the guy forgot to tighten the wheel or the some plug <laughs> <laughs> and we've all had that and I think, you know, the important part of those lessons is to put those checks in place because you don't want that bad experience. You've got to check your own parachute. You check your own parachute. <laughs> Do I have a parachute?